Hello and welcome to the I for Energy seminar series. We had a, a, a last minute change. Um, Louise Mazingo, Professor Louise Mazingo, had departmental duties and we were very lucky to have uh, Dr. Solomon Abebe Aswa um, take her place for today. So um, and I wanted to welcome also those who are watching this on the other campuses, UC Merced, UC Davis, and UC Santa Cruz. Dr. Solomon Abebe Aswa received his undergraduate degree in physics from Bahir Dar University in Bahir Dar, Ethiopia. A master's of science in physics from the Norwegian University of Science and Technology in Trondheim, Norway. And a second master's of science and PhD specializing in energy system modeling from Ben Gurion University in Israel. So, um, a lot of traveling. <laughs> He was a recipient of the 2010 Wolf Prize for Outstanding PhD Students in Israeli Universities, and he's con uh, con currently a postdoc fellow at UC Berkeley with uh, Dan Kamen over in the ERG department. Solomon's research in interests include very high grid penetration of intermittent renewable energy sources, solar and wind, with and without energy storage, the role of storage design and dispatch, and long-term planning of power grid. His findings have been published in peer-reviewed journals as book chapters and conference proceedings. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Solomon Abebe. Thank you, Teres, for the introduction. Thank you also for having me. And thanks for coming for this talk and for also for those who are attending the talk elsewhere. Um, uh, through the web. I will be speaking on integration of very large intermittent renewable system to the electricity grid. I will specifically focus on storage design and use and, and how they affect us in transitioning to very high penetration. My work my work um, this work, uh, I have been working on this for almost six years now. And this is part of my PhD study and also part of my postdoctoral study at UC Berkeley. I will give you a brief introduction and then move to the uh, very high penetration scenario. I will discuss the Iceland grid scenario for using Israel's grid and then discuss about the interconnected scenario for using California's data and give, uh, finally, conclusion and recommendations uh, in the end. When we speak about electricity grid, we think we speak about a system which is designed to supply a varying cons cons consumer demand. The consumer demand varies b based on season and business cycle and weather. Here you see four uh, curves for, from four different seasons. The red curve is from uh, July, a week in July, and you can see that the peak reached the highest in this case, and the uh, black curve is for the week in January, and you can see the difference between the two, that in summer, in the summer, the peak comes during the daytime, which is due to air conditioning load. And the peak during spring, during the winter time, is due to heating load, which comes in the in evening time. And in Israel, the peak demand is expected in both seasons. It could occur either in summer or spring, in winter time. In the spring and autumn reason, uh, season profile is a little bit lower than both uh, both summer and winter. For California, the demand profile is almost the same except uh, the peak that occurs only during summertime. Uh, it doesn't occur in spring and winter time as is the case in Israel, but this could change a little bit probably if uh, the heating load is connected to electricity in the future. This is a typical daily demand, uh, and I, I'm just using this to show how the electricity is supplied. It is supplied by a set of dispatchable uh, power plants, which has different flexibility. 
the lower part, which is uh, covered by the black um, area, is uh, taken as a base load, which is supplied by uh, power plants, which are less flexible. And the next layer is an intermediate demand layer, which is supplied by a more flexible power plants. So when I say flexible, they can be ramped better than the base load power plants, and they have also on-off uh, the capability to do on-off cycles throughout the year more than the base load power plants. And the uh, top layer is the peaking layer, which is supplied by uh, power plants, which has uh, fast startup and uh, ramping capability, which we call them uh, mostly, uh, which uh, we, we term as uh, peakers. But when we speak about integrating intermittent renewable system, we speak about non-dispatchable technologies. Their output depends on the weather conditions. The solar output depends on solar radiance, and wind output depends on the wind speed at a particular time and location. Here you see um, different curves, uh, four, uh, three curves for different uh, system. The black curve, broken curve here, is for solar output in California, which is 11 gigawatts, and the red one is for um, wind system in California, and the green curve gives you the composite. Uh, I think you, could, you cannot see the other curve, which is here, which shows the corresponding load profile for the same week in, spring, uh, in one spring week. So what you see here is a composite of the two, the wind and the solar, better match the demand profile, while one of them doesn't do as well. And you can also see the variation is very dynamic in, even in particular week. But the variation is very large when you see the variation from season to season, which you can see in this figure. The red curve uh, here, uh, by the way, the legend is up here on all my figures. The red curve gives you the solar output, the daily total out output, and you could see that the total output is very large in summertime, but it could uh, go uh, much lower in spring and uh, winter seasons. But when you see uh, the wind, which is uh, broken black curves, the wind output peaks in spring season, uh, as opposed to the solar, solar system, which peaks in summer, and the output is lower during winter season. So this is a very uh, versatile dynamics that we are dealing with. And as compared to solar, the wind output also peaks, which shows that the profile has some kind of periodicity, which means wind has some good generation days, which is preceded or followed by some bad generation days. That is why it is speaking here. So when you speak about integrating PV and wind system to the electricity grid, we also speak about the factors that affect us, which is matching the profile of this intermittent renewable system output to the electricity grid uh, demand profile. If we can't do those things, the penetration that we could reach from intermittent renewable system will be very much limited, as we can see it is later. I will first define some terminologies that I will be using. Grid, flex grid flexibility. Grid flexibility just represents the set of aggregate gate generator, which uh, could be ramped down below some peak demand by some value. When I say flexibility FF equal to 0.7 or 70%, I mean the base load is 30% and the remaining part is a flexible part which can be solarized or can be supplied by renewable under that particular condition. Penetration, when I mean penetration, I mean energy penetration. That is the total amount of energy supplied by intermittent renewable, per, uh, renewable system as a percent of the total demand in that particular condition. Nodem system is uh, just a term I defined to um, refer 
as a set of a variable technologies, wind and solar, uh, that uh, could supply the maximum possible energy to the grid without any energy dumping. The term dumping refers to curtailment here. Let me pass directly to the uh, Israeli system analysis. The IEC grid, I did the analysis for 2006, was composed of 10.5 gigawatt power plants, and that is entirely thermal, coal and gas firing power plants, and it supplied about 50 terawatt hours of energy per year, and to about 7 million total population. And it covers about 20,000 square kilometers, which is about half of the greater Los Angeles area, which is a very small region. It is an island. It's not connected to any other grid. The intermittent renewable resource we, are studied, we have studied is distributed in this region, which is the Negev, part, the Negev desert part of Israel, which covers about 60% of the total uh, country. And we have eight sites. Uh, from which we have gathered meteorological data. We have made simulation for different uh, technologies, uh, tracking and non-tracking PV, and wind technologies. And when we study, uh, when we do the analysis, we have studied various things, how technology change affects penetration, and how hybridizing the system affects penetration, and so on but I will speak just about a very small part of the work we have done. This is a the uh, three cases for, uh, from one week for different flexibility uh, in IEC grid during the year 2006. As you can see it here, when flexibility is lower on the top uh, figure, which is FF equal to 0 0.7, the solar penetration is limited to the upper layer, and penetration is very low. And the year-round penetration about is for no dump case is about 5.5%. And when you increase penetration, as you can see it in a bottom uh, figure, the penetration could uh, reach um, about 17%. You cannot go beyond that uh, by any means. So the option you have, we have is just to test other uh, scenarios like changing technology and see how energy dumping could affect. Energy dumping, when you increase energy dumping, uh, allow energy dumping, you can increase penetration during the shoulder hours of solar generations. So as you can see in this figure, when you increase energy dumping, initially penetration increases, but it levels out when you uh, allow more and more energy penetrations. For 5% energy penetration, the penetration reached about 27% of the annual demand for FF equal to 1, which is increasing from about 70% in an ODM case. And the other option uh, we have looked is just technology mix, wind and solar. Uh, Technology-wise, tracking systems, CPVs could do better than a fixed flat plate PVs in terms of penetration. And when you mix wind and solar, you can see these two figures here. The right one is just showing you solar penetrations for three different weeks in different um, uh, season. The pink color represents the solar, and the gray one is load. And under this case, you can only reach 70% penetration, as I've already spoke about. And the, ra the right plot shows the wind-solar blend, 50-50% wind and solar technologies. And you can see two, two very important things under this scenario. Penetration increased from 17% to 20%. And you, as you can see it here, as compared to the wind or solar uh, technology alone, the ramping decreases. You can see that uh, at least clearly in the last figure, the, the bottom figures. If you compare, the ramping is larger for solar. And if you see the wind PV hybrid, it just simply shaves the peak demand hours perfectly. The reason this is occurring is because wind complements solar in meeting the hour demand profile. 
wind peaks during evening and solar peaks during midday. That, that does a, a good job. And there is no other way to increase, to, uh, to increase penetration other than this. The IEC grid, based on analysis, have the flexibility, technical flexibility that could reach about 80%. And under that condition, penetration could be only 30%, about 30%. And if you have to go to higher penetration using wind and solar hybrid, you can only reach 46% for FF equal to 1. There's no way than using energy storage. But when we speak about energy storage, storage could be used for mitigating intermittency, and it could also be used to increase penetration. I will not speak about the other one because this work is not about it, but I will speak about the role of storage in increasing energy penetration. I will give you a uh, definition here. Energy capacity of storage is the amount, the maximum amount of energy that a given storage can store. Power capacity is the instantaneous power that it can store or deliver. And efficiency is a term um, we use to... Um, uh, to uh, show how the storage performs during storing and uh, releasing process. In our study, we use uh, round trip efficiency of about 75, uh, uh, of 75% for this study. So to begin with seeing how uh, storage did matters, it is important first to see what the energy uh, surplus energy generation looks like. This here, I present three cases. When I increase the system size to be three node dump, five node dump, and seven node dump. As you can see it here in this red curve, the energy being generated is very much pronounced in spring season. The reason this is happening is because high generation of solar is met with a low demand during spring season. And you can also see spiky uh, nature. This is occurring because of the, um, the variability of demand throughout the week. During the weekend, the demand is very low, so you have a spiky nature, and you will dump much energy during the weekends. When it comes to um, summer season, summer, the solar generation very well overlaps with the peak demand hours. But in the winter, even if you have a peaking demand, the solar generation doesn't overlap with the demand because there is because of the lack of coincidence between the peak demand and solar generation, and then you start dumping energy. If you increase the system size, you will see the same trend. But this has a different meaning on energy storage. You will see that in the next slide. For the three no dump and uh, five no dump case, as you can see it on this figure, just look at the blue curve. Storage need, um, actually the energy capacity of the storage in this case is, as you can see it, is defined by the maximum energy that it stores uh, throughout the year. What I do when I sto do storage analysis is just I ignore energy dumping. I simply oversize the system and calculate the energy storage that is required. And the reason I'm doing is because the present scenario, the present policy doesn't motivate energy dumping. But we will see a different story uh, at the end of this talk. So um, what happens here is just as uh, is discussed in the previous slide, you can see that the Excess in energy generation in spring resulted in a large need in storage during spring season, but you don't need any storage in summer. Um, and again, you need storage during uh, winter time. Yeah. And when you increase the system size from three node dump to five node dump, you don't see that dramatic change. But when you increase it to seven node dump, the storage um, requirement trends dramatically changes, as you can see it on this curve. So in the previous case, the corresponding energy capacity was 20 and 40 gigawatt hours, 
but now it reached 200 gigawatt hours. The reason this is occurring is when you increase the system size, the energy being dumped become very large that the storage, the stored energy um, become more than what you can, uh, what uh, the, the corresponding nighttime demand. And as a result, the storage doesn't discharge all of the energy it stores, and the next day it starts storing more energy. And as due to that, the energy storage capacity increases and increases continuously when this occurs for successive days. And when uh, summer load picks up, then it starts discharging that energy. And this has a significant meaning on our ability to use storage to increase grid penetration. Here you see on the left uh, plot energy penetration versus energy capacity. As you can see uh, here, when you increase energy storage capacity, initially penetration increases, but it starts to level off depending on grid flexibility. So even if you have a grid which is perfectly flexible, the maximum penetration you can reach is about 70, uh, 75%. You can't go more than that. that means this graph shows that to increase energy penetration, increasing energy storage is not a good way. So you have some threshold that you shouldn't cross. This shows that, um, that storage use vary depending on system size. You can see that on this figure. Uh, this is usefulness index per energy capacity. Usefulness index is just simply something I defined. It just gives you the total amount of energy delivered by story divided by the corresponding energy capacity. So initially, when energy storage capacity increases, the storage usefulness index increases. And then it reaches some peak, and then it starts declining. So what we have taken from this is just the maximum you should do is just to find other alternatives, like choosing uh, the largest storage, which corresponds to the peak EC, and then start energy dumping to see if you can go to high penetration. This is what you see in this on this curve. When you start increasing total energy loss, which in this case, which includes energy loss due to uh, storage efficiency and cut element, the penetration, PV penetration increases, and at 20% total energy loss, penetration for uh, 94.5 gigawatt hours of storage reaches about uh, 87% from uh, below 70% of the annual demand. This is very significant. And the storage, the other story is that the storage I am speaking about, this 94.5 gigawatt is about 72% of the daily average demand. So the storage we need is lower than the daily average demand. And together with this, we have just checked around our results. Are the curves that we are seeing, this is the power capacity and the energy capacity. And our calculation shows that as you increase system size, there is some interlink between power capacity and energy capacity. What will happen if you change that, if you go outside the curve? For example, take FF equal to 1. Um, sorry. Okay. Um, if you go, if you take this region, the region below the curve, what would happen is the energy capacity is lower, but power capacity is lower, larger. There is a senior pena serious penalty in terms of energy penetrations. When you go to this region, what will happen is the energy capacity of the system is larger, but you don't benefit much a lot as compared to the corresponding uh, storage on this curve. So this interlink is very significant. Um, and we went up or here. 
uh, behind the threshold. And we picked a storage on that curve and tried to see if that changed. And we didn't see significant benefits. That means even if you increase energy storage under different, scen different scenario, uh, it doesn't help you a lot. So this requires just understanding how the seasonal intermittent renewable system variation and the demand profile chooses those interlink storage, uh, interlink between storage energy capacity and power capacity. This is simple dispatch uh, for our 94.5 gigawatt storage and at 20% energy dumping. As you can see here, the yellow uh, colored area is by storage, the energy supplied from storage, and the red one is direct PV supply, and the gray color is the backup system. So as you can see it here, in, uh, during winter season, you will need significant backup, but you don't need any significant during most of the spring days, and you need a small backup during uh, summertime. And if you go, uh, we just went through this data and studied what it looks like throughout the year and picked the worst week. This is the worst week here. So this, if you see this graph, the graph shows, especially on the fourth day, that you have to keep the backup capacity that should be able to supply the peak demand load. That is what it suggests, which means Israel should keep its 10.5 gigawatt capacity to supply this demand. But this is not correct because you have a storage facility. You can do nighttime charging and then uh, use that energy for peak shaving. And as you can see, it's here. If you change the way you dispatch it, the generator capacity requirement significantly decreases. The capacity requirement we see here is 6.8 gigawatt. But we have added about 15% reserve margin, and it shows that uh, the capacity is about 7.5, which is 3 gigawatt less than the uh, capacity that Israel maintained that year. But I have a second thought about the reserve margin. I will show you that in the end of the stock. If you want to know more details, these are the publications that will discuss in detail this work, and you are welcome to read it. And the first three is just about storage and backup and things related to it. And the third, the remaining three discusses uh, penetration without energy storage. Now I'll pass to the interconnected scenario of California's grid. In this case, what I did is just I have taken uh, the data from switch model. Uh, switch model divides the work region into 50 load areas, but I have taken... 12 load areas in California, and I've taken the corresponding distributed renewables throughout, uh, rena throughout California. The system includes uh, rooftop PV, uh, residential rooftop PV, uh, uh, CSP without storage, uh, offshore and onshore wind, PV uh, static, and one axis tracking PV. So uh, what I do here is uh, I have to just capture the entire dynamics. I have created five problems. The first problem calculates the NODAM system, and then I have two parallel models which uh, study the storage design requirement. Uh, I have just created those, those two models to use them as a control because I don't know what factors affect each of them. And then, on the other hand, I have a uh, simple analysis which sees how much penetration could be reached without um, using energy storage. And then, by using both storage design models, I, I study the results that I have uh, found and then defined a proper storage. And after that, I use that storage and allowed energy dumping by defining the power capacity and the energy capacity by that specific, to that specific storage. And that is what I will briefly describe here. Okay, uh, you will see here uh, penetration without energy storage. 
the, you see a blue curve here, down here, when you knock out transmission and see the penetration, the penetration is very low. So you will need transmission between systems, between the load areas. Uh, this, is, this also argues against going for distribution because the distribution system may not help us in decarbonizing the power sector a lot as compared to using the interconnected system. But when we use existing system, existing transmission um, lines between load areas and see how penetration fares, what we see is Penetration initially increases as you increase energy uh, dumping, as usual. But I don't see any difference between um, the existing transmission and a case when I increase transmission lines by capacity. So transmission line in this case doesn't help us in increasing renewable penetrations. That is what this data is showing. But even if you use energy dumping, uh, you cannot reach much penetrations. At 5%, the penetration you reach is about 50%. You cannot go beyond that without uh, using energy storage in California as well. So uh, I will present the storage case here. You have a curve which shows uh, penetration versus network energy capacity. The network energy capacity means the total storage energy capacity built uh, over the 12 uh, load areas in California. So when initially storage capacity increases, penetration increases, but it levels off. Just it shows the same story to the Israeli cases. And it levels off especially when storage starts to exceed daily average demand. So, but one thing I want to mention is the two models I've used. Is the, there are two models. The one model is allows energy transfer between load areas. One doesn't allow energy transfer between load areas using transmission. The energy transfer is only limited to uh, energy stored. The other energy can be transferred. Um, and based on that, I started seeing some difference. The difference occurred simply because the model which allows stored energy transmission have found some way of decreasing backup capacity more than the other one by increasing energy storage. This is what you see on this curve. This curve shows on the x-axis renewable system size and on the left y-axis the network energy storage capacity and on the right y-axis the conventional backup capacity. As you can see it, when you increase energy capacity, the backup capacity decreases in both cases. And, but it decreases more for the model which allows the stored energy transmission. But when you see the other side, the energy storage, the corresponding energy storage capacity is um, much uh, larger here. And I have looked the corresponding usefulness index for this two storage. As you can see it, the trend is again similar to what we have seen in the Israeli case. It initially rises and then reach some peak and it starts to decrease. But there are some new things which we found. The peak can, several peaks can occur based on the scenario you are analyzing. The reason this is occurring is this model builds different resource and can build independent of what it has already built in the previous step. So that could increase on, uh, that could change the storage use, uh, especially near the peak, the, where the peak, uh, where the UI peaks. But generally, it tells the same story. The storage use increases initially, reaches some value, some peak value, and then decreases. So, so increasing the storage doesn't help you a lot uh, in increasing penetration as usual. So I have making, after making some analysis, I picked two peak uh, 
storage technologies that are related to peak UI, um, and then used that storage to assess how penetration uh, changes when you allow energy dumping. As you can see on this figure, total energy capacity, uh, the penetration on the y-axis and the x-axis total energy, and the right y-axis is conventional backup requirements. So when you initially increase energy dumping, penetration increases. And when you penetration increases about 20%, uh, the energy penetration by the same storage, if I take 90, 186 gigawatt hours of storage, it could reach about 85% of the annual demand. But I don't see significant difference between the two storage. But one of the storage is significantly large, uh, which is the one, uh, the storage which is defined by, based on the uh, energy stored being transmitted, the, the model which allows the transmission of the stored energy. And, and that still confirms the theory that I have spoken about earlier which is increasing in storage doesn't help you a lot in increasing grid penetration of intermittent renewable system. The surprising story is that energy dumping has got value in this case. As you can see here, when total energy loss increases, the curve shows that this curve shows that the conventional capacity requirement, backup capacity requirement significantly reduces. For 20% energy uh, loss, the conventional backup requirement was about 35 gigawatts. And this could supply the year-round hourly demand, including 59 gigawatt hours peak demand. 59 gigawatt peak demand of the year. Uh, this is a dispatch. As you can see it here, uh, this is a direct renewable you can see the backups, and you can see where they are being used. And you can also see the storage use, which is uh, more used in spring uh, in this figure. Uh, and, and this system, a 20% energy loss, supplied the hourly demand, including the 59 gigawatt peak demand, plus 5.3% distribution loss. And now you can ask yourself, what about reserve? Do we need to add reserves? And I have two things which argued against me on adding reserves. First, in this scenario, the challenge we have is just excess energy generation. At some hours, we generate too much excess energy including up to 60%, 60 gigawatt in some hour in spring. And, but this is not the major point. This is the major point, the second one. This is the generation curve for the backup system throughout the year. So as you can see here, it's only reached only one close to the 35 gigawatt generation, backup generation required. When I assess the curve, what I found is it is only 400 hours of the year that takes generation, backup generation more than 26 gigawatt hours. The rest of the time, the generation requirement was lower than that. Then if you add a reserve to the system, what you're doing is just simply you're adding uh, additional backup conventional system to a bunch of already idle technologies. So what I'm thinking is just based on the scenarios you're going to use, it's better to consider um, like options like uninterruptible load and so on in your planning than just the present day uh, requirements that regulatory commissions are, in, in, uh, are enforcing. So these kind of policy scenarios are very important in our, uh, uh, in our future to achieve high penetrations. So generally, 
what I say is to design an efficient and least cost grid, which could accommodate very high intermittent renewable system, we have to be able to capture different uh, physical and policy scenarios of the future grid, including the operational scenarios that we see that allows energy dumping. And designing and operation should also, of course, be on the seasonal and done interaction of intermittent renewable system and uh, local load profile. And this shows something very important about the economic models. They have to have at least four um, requirements to do these things. The first one is they should have to meet the uh, requirements that flexibility of storage design, uh, that we should have a flexibility to so design and dispatch storage. The other one is they have to have the ability to complement, to capture complementarities between wind and solar technologies, which is very, very important because when they complement, they don't only increase penetration and reduce ramping, they can also reduce the required uh, energy storage. For California, what I found is the, what we've seen is the storage is 186 gigawatt hour. That is 22% of the daily average demand. But if you take the wind, the solar alone, and wind alone system, it is much higher than that. So we have to know how to bring together those advantages and try to measure uh, economically uh, in our model. And as I said, flexible operational policy uh, is very important. We have to see how dumping, energy dumping could be valued, and we have to know how to um, measure the, the opportunity cost of future energy dumping in the planning stage. And we, have, we also have to have the ability in our modeling to capture the complementarities of the other resource, the conventional resource that give a backup for the storage and renewable systems in our modeling. So uh, I will finish my talk by this one. And this is my acknowledgement. I specifically want to thank Professor David Feynman from Ben Gurion University of uh, Ben Gurion University of the Negev in Israel and his team. And Professor Dan Kamen and his switch team at UC Berkeley. If you want more information, just you can email me. This I'm happy to take this. Thank you. Do you have questions? I was looking at today's issue of the San Francisco Chronicle, and on page one, they discussed uh, a snowfall in the Sierra Nevadas, and in some places we would have 40% less water available. How will this affect your research? Um, at this point, I'm not dealing with um, water, because I'm dealing with intermittent renewables, um, wind and solar. So, so uh, I can't say anything about that. Uh, it looks like your analysis addresses quite comprehensively the variability of those intermittent resources. Yeah. But what keeps the ISO awake at night is more than variability, is uncertainty that they are facing the day had unit commitment. Okay. So as a result of that, they have to commit units that are going to stand there at minimum load and uh, in anticipation of unexpected ramps or unexpected fluctuations in the, in the wind. Okay. And that amplifies tremendously the effects that you are pointing because um, if you have to keep a whole bunch of resources, gas turbines at minimum load, in order to fill in and to, and to, to, 
to be able to address the um, you know the the the, high, the unexpected ramps, then you wasting much more renewable than you you, you know probably double <laughs> the, yeah. the waste of what you are predicting. There is also the other thing that in California the price of electricity change every five minutes. So the way to measure storage is not in terms of energy, but in terms of dollars saved, because the, the, you 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 creating a, the, what the storage provides is intertemporal arbitrage of prices. And that's the way to evaluate what's the value of storage. Um, I, I, I think in terms of just looking to the variability um, and the role of unit commitment, what we do today is good for low penetration. And we could also find a way, especially when we start uh, exceeding 25% uh, annual penetrations, we have to look to that, this kind of analysis and the use of energy storage because you can put some base load and still use storage and increase penetrations. And if we don't go storage, as you said, what will happen is just we will keep a bunch of conventional power plants online and they don't help us in increasing penetration. So storage is very much necessary to reach to very high penetration from intermittent renewable systems. And as compared, as, as regard to valuation, I have a lot of questions regarding storage valuation because storage is not a conventional system. In conventional system, when you ramp it up and you ramp it down, they have uh, their own impact on grid system and also they, you pay for the ramping. But in storage, the story is different. They, what they are doing is they are not ramping. Of course, they ramp, but they are ramping in a different way. They store energy when it is excess and then supply you that energy. So it is not good to compare it to the role of storage in the present grid because the role of storage in the present grid and the role of storage in the future grid when there is high penetration is completely different. So we have to think about those things and try to come up with the correct valuation of uh, storage role in uh, power grid. I was a little bit hazy on the efficiency numbers for your, uh, you were assuming for storage. Now, currently, I think the, the only practical storage is, is pumped water, and, which is like, I think, 20 or 30 percent has uh, inefficient, and um, uh, maybe in the future flow batteries or something. But w what, what kind of assumptions are you making about current and future efficiencies of the uh, and energy loss of the storage system? Uh, I think I can mention a couple of storage from batteries we could, which could have close to 75%, like sodium sulfur and vanadium redox. And there are also other technologies which are like lithium uh, ion batteries and ultra, bi ultra uh, capacitor, which are, has even higher uh, um, efficiency. So this analysis, the energy capacities that I have presented here, even though I'm not simulating some sp uh, specific storage, uh, could be taken as a sodium sulfur storage with DOD 90%, something like that. So I do think that we have a storage uh, know-how at the present time to consider that, this kind of options. And in, what is most important here is just as we speak about hybrid system about, uh, on intermittent renewable systems, we also have to think about hybrid system about storage, on storage. Just the same way we use different conventionals to supply the varying demand, we can use different storage to uh, handle different challenges that come with intermittent renewable system and, and variability of the load. Last question. Thanks, uh, very interesting. And all the oodles of data that you displayed, I think, uh, and following up on the uh, valuation, are, would you be able to put marginal uh, a value on the marginal value of one unit of storage in relation to one unit of 
renewable generation additional for the various uh, penetration points that you've you summarized? Or do you know a number off the top of your that, head? That is difficult to do, uh, this part, because I didn't think about doing those things. Uh, there is much complexity to uh, put those things because it depends on grid flexibilities that you're considering and also depends on how you dispatch your storage. Sure. Um, but for, for example, that utilization ratio number. Uh, utilization that, ratio, is that, is okay. That, is that the ratio of those two marginal values in penetration or something like that? Uh, utilization ratio is just simply tells you how you dispatch storage that year. So uh, in most cases, the storage utilization is lower than 100%. But the storage utilization could reach about 27% in most cases, based on the systems that we have right now. So when I increase energy dumping, that utilization increases. And that utilization also depends on amount of energy that you are allowing to dump. So I didn't think about uh, putting a marginal um, value of storage as regard to intermit uh, intermittent strain and penetration. <coughs> Thank you very much. Welcome. Thanks.